Welcome back to the Upper Tier Podcast. This is your Champions League match reaction. Chelsea 4, Malmo 0. Man United 3, Atalanta 2. Joining me tonight for these match reactions, Ted. How are we doing, Ted? Ah, not too bad, how are you? Not too bad at all. Happy, Much more happier Man United fans on tonight than last night, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. Also joining me, my partner in crime on these shows, Darren. How are we doing, Darren? Hey, Noel. Hey, Ted. How are you doing, lads? Oh, not too bad. bad. These boys decked out in the Man United gear. That must have been a quick change in the last 10 minutes, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's start with Chelsea. Um, not um, unusual for Chelsea to go out and pump Malmo. We kind of expected it. Uh, four goals to nil. Outstanding performance from Chelsea, but nothing less than what we would expect. Goals from Christensen, no less. Um, two from our boy Jorginho, or my boy Jorginho. Um, two penalties, let's not get excited, yeah? Two penalties, come on <laughs> now. Jesus no, Christ. Listen, listen, penalties can be missed as well as scores. So they were, so they were, penalties meant nothing when Bruno took them, and all of a sudden when Jorginho takes them, they're a big fucking deal. Give me a break, will you? Uh, and then one <laughs> Holy in, Jesus. And, and one in between for Coy Havertz. Um, but safe to say Chelsea bossed this game, no doubt about it. Um, without a shadow of a doubt, uh, 4-0, nothing less than what we expected. And they are now... If I am right, bang slap into qualification there. Juventus with nine points on top and Chelsea with six second in the group. Zenit with three and Malmo with zip. So we would expect Chelsea to go through there. It's really only a question now when they meet Juventus again. Who goes top of the group, basically. Um, let's get on to United. Um, what can we say about this? Unbelievable. Talking about a game of two halves. Ted. Oh, I tell you, in the WhatsApp group, we were chatting about that first half, and good luck to us. We may as well have been fielding, you know, the under 11s or something out there against them. The boys were absolutely brutal. Um, it started off kind of all right. Rashford had a chance. I know he was offside, but him missing that chance is just off as well. Like he should, he needs to be burying that because I think even if you're offside, if you still put that in the net, it, it gives that sort of bounce to everyone around you, you know, like well, we could have had a goal there sort of thing, and he, he missed it. You are just, I was like, oh, good, good luck, lads. You can't be missing chances like that. And then two fucking simple goals as well. Um, the defence, I, I, I don't know what the story is. It's like they, they wanted to play an offside trap for that first one, but were too slow to actually do it. Mm. And then I think Harry Maguire must have been playing FIFA or something because he was about 10 seconds too late to be jumping to try and defend that header for the second goal. I don't know what he was at. It was like there was a, la- it was like there was a lag on his Wi-Fi. Yeah. That's, that's what I was about to say. <laughs> it was actually like there was a lag on his Wi-Fi that he, that he clipped the button and about four minutes later he went, oh, header. You know, yeah. I was like, what the fuck happened there? Ball was already back in the centre circle. Someone to press Sky, <laughs> someone to press Sky pause just on the United team. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was mad. Um, I have to say, in the first half, I thought United, they were a bit lackluster. They were standoffish. They gave Atlanta, Atlanta the space that they needed. Um, and it just seemed like it was just such a weird half as well. I know United had created a couple of chances, but didn't put them away. Rashford was kind of all over the place. Um, but then there was there was comments made in the commentary as well that, like he wasn't tracking back and he wasn't putting in the shift when the team was under a caution, stuff like that as well, um, which was fairly noticeable. Bruno, first half, was kind of anonymous. Didn't really do a whole lot. Um, obviously, Solskjaer went in a half-time and obviously had words with the boys or else Pogba gave one of his infamous France, French speeches in the locker room or something like that, whatever it was. But the boys came out with a different vigour in the second half, Darren. Yeah, massive. It really was, you know, part of the poem, but it was a massive change, wasn't it, in the game of two halves? Um, like, I suppose we still had chances in the fourth half, you know? You've obviously got Rashford hitting the crossbar and stuff like that, and, and barred a couple of, not necessarily errors, but Maguire not getting up for that ball, and then, the you know, the fourth goal as well. Like, we weren't being battered, let's say. The, the score line was ever so slightly flattering, I would have said, to Atalanta at halftime, you know? Um, because again, we were still racking up shots on target. The keeper was making good saves and stuff like that. Uh, and then, but then in the second half, it just became, you know, it got it got into. I felt like it was. I was listening to that song, wave after wave, because they just kept rolling and rolling and rolling. You know, 
Um, and it was great because a couple of lads stood up for me, I have to be honest with you. Um, I thought Juan Bissaka was excellent in the second half. Um, looked way, way better going forward. And actually wanted to get on the ball and drive. And I was like, why are you waiting to get 2-0 down to do this, kid? Like, yeah. You should be at this as a right back, you know, from, from minute one to minute 95 or whatever you're on there for. Don't wait your 2 nil down to start playing the hero. Do you know what I mean? Look, that's a bit late in the day for that. Yeah. Um, I thought Pogba made a difference when he came on in midfield. Really, really did. Uh, started to take control of the midfield and get the ball a little bit higher up the pitch. And a bit quicker as well. You know, there wasn't so many sideways passes. All the passes seemed to be forward, forward, forward. And we were on the front foot then, you know. Um, Rashford, I think, took the goal very, very well. Uh, it's a serious ball from Bruno. Uh, as anonymous as he was at times during the game. You know, you look at it and, and he's still involved in a couple of the goals. Um, but the ball for Rashford is super. I mean, we've been very critical of Rashford's finishing as United fans over the years. Uh, it was a great goal he got at the weekend and it's another good goal he got tonight. He's got two and two and he's going to play a big part for us as this as he as he comes back to full fitness, I think, you know? Yeah. Just, just on that goal though, Darren, that was the hardest chance he had. And th- this has been a, yeah. a story with Rashford for years. You'll give him 20 easy chances and he'll he'll miss, he'll smash it straight at the keeper, he'll hit the post, he'll hit the crossbar, he'll do everything but put it in the back of the net. And then you put him into this position where you're like, ah, that's a tough old chance there. And he'll bury it. Like, I don't, I don't yeah, know what he, the story is with the kid. I feel I feel like he's very, very similar to Raheem Sterling like that. You know, Sterling needs three, four chances at times and, and, and the easy ones he kind of puts wide or, or he scuffs up and then there's a keeper and there's a bad touch. And, but then a ball comes out of nowhere and all of a sudden he scored. And you're like, did he score again? You know, it's it, like Rashford's stats are so so good at United but at times the, the performance is flatter to deceive a little bit and, and he is you know he does stutter through games at times but he's got so much ability it only takes something like that boom you've got a goal you know what I mean and then that's another one notched up and lads are like well you know he has to play games because he's got a goal and assist every other you know what I mean that type of thing uh, but he does he certainly he needs to maybe hone those finishing skills a little bit if he wants to take the step to the next level and um, yeah. be it with United or with England because that was something we would have seen in the past with the likes of, say, Ronaldo. You know, when he came to United first, um, was, was you know, was involved in an awful lot, but was missing and he was and he was taking... Look, I, re- I remember seeing games where Ronaldo was taking 10 or 15 shots a game for United yeah. and you were just going, like, what's going on here, pal? You know, those other blokes on the pitch. But I suppose, and, and, and it's, a, it's a strange kind of comparison I'm going to make, uh, Kobe Bryant was, uh, was he number four on the all-time scorers list in the NBA yeah, something and like he, that yeah yeah and he's actually number one on the misses list nobody's missed more shots than Kobe Bryant in the NBA so there is that balance of of, of you know having to having to get shots off as well that to, to keep the numbers up as well do you know what I mean um, and I think that where that's where Rashford needs to kind of he needs to hone that side of the game as well but I, I think I've been impressed with him since he got back from injury I've, I've been impressed with him it's just it's, it's the same story that was you had before you went out for that injury where yeah you're kind of looking at him and going, come on, man, you've been put in for four or five clear-cut chances that you'd be expecting anybody to bury, and yeah. you've missed them all. And then, similar to kind of uh, to Mane, I suppose, in recent form, where Mane is missing all these simple chances, and then you give him a tough one because he doesn't have the time to think about what am I going to do, and he just buries it. Um, there's, def- there's, definitely a, there's definitely a time and issue, isn't there, where, where yeah. he's got too much time. And he's got all this stuff going through his head, and there's there's no clear decision between A, B, C, and D. And he does the A, which is neither of them, and you end up going, Jeez, there's another chance squandered. Oh, and no. and the thing, sorry, and the thing is, like you might get away with it on a night like tonight against Atalanta, but I mean, Sunday's a massive game for us right now. Sunday yeah. is huge, and and we know he's had he's had a bit of um, he's had some form against Liverpool in the past. He likes playing against Trent. You know, um, and and he needs to be at it straight away from minute one and taking those chances. We're not going to get ten chances against Liverpool. You no. know, if we get five, we'd be lucky. You know, and we've got to take one of those or two of those to give us any chance. The way we're defending at the minute, you know. What What do you about make of Ollie in terms of not in terms of his position and whether he's there or not there but in terms of every time he seems to be at the brink he finds a way of coming back and he's done it a number of times at this stage um, what, 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 what's your thinking on it? 
there was um, the the guy that was doing the interview after the game um, spoke about how it looked like the team were playing for him. And Solskjaer said, don't you dare go there. You know, he said, don't disrespect the players like that. But there is a certain amount of that, you know, because the closer he gets to that exit door, the more the lads seem to dig in a little bit. Now, again, that's something you want. But you're also kind of thinking, why do we have to be absolutely dead in the trenches before the lads are starting to, to fire back? Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. um, it was, it really is. And it's happened to us previously where, you know, you were thinking, oh, he lives on Sunday, he's gone. So we go out, we beat City 2-0 and you're thinking, Jesus, what happened there? And we'd no form going into the game. And you're thinking, these are these boys are going to thump us. Um, and he's done it a few times. So they they do kind of, they do dig in and fight for him. You know, but but I think again, it's it's back to for me, it's back to the the lack lack of like tactical astuteness and, and, and awareness and the kind of nous and that kind of experience and stuff like that as a manager that he's lacking a little bit, you know, um, and that's maybe why whatever message is going out when they're going out onto the field, it's not going out the way it's been delivered because the lads don't look like they know what what's what he wants from them, you know. I think I think the problem for him as well is he's he's still trying to figure out his eleven, isn't he? Um, yeah, I sp- well, yeah, he's, he is this season, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, it's no surprise to me we look better again when Cavani come on tonight as well. Um, his work rate is phenomenal. You know, you're talking about Ronaldo getting the goal, um, and the goal is obviously very very important. But Cavani's work rate, he just sets a tone. You know, you look there in the 87th, 88th minute, he's back and he's he's over in the corner flag trying to hassle one of the Atalanta boys. Now, again, Ronaldo got sucked in by this and, and he kind of went, Jesus, that guy's back there, you know, with a shovel in his hand. And all of a sudden, I looked a minute later and then Ronaldo's there winning a header and you're thinking, this is more like it. But it's like there doesn't, there's no there's no necessary leadership to begin games and stuff like that where lads are, are getting off on the front foot and where they're, where they're pressing from the front and they're really hassling teams, you know, are so standoffish, as you spoke about in the first half. Um, and you're, we're giving teams like Atalanta and Leicester so much respect. It's scary, you know, and we really need to be in their faces. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. We need to become a team of nasty bastards. We really do. Because teams, teams come into Old Trafford and, and when we're going to their grounds, they're like, they're not scared of Man United anymore. Nobody is, well, you know. And when, when you have a lack of confidence in your own ability at times, it can generate that as well, you know what I mean? And it's, it, it, it's a difficult one to call, really. Like, if you think about tonight, Ted, you might want to take this one, but at half time, Atalanta were top of the group and United were bottom of the group. Then we finish out the night with young boys bottom of the group and Man United top of the group. It's, it's, it's just a, such a weird conundrum, really, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I, I agree with Darren that, you know, it does seem to be that the players dig in when we when it looks like Ole is on his way out the door. And I'd like to say that, you know, oh well, Ole does something to change, you know, uh, you know, he changes tactics or something, and that's why when he gets put in this position that something seems to change, but he doesn't. So that's what makes it so confusing. It's not like he's gone and changed tactics. It's not like he's gone and done something crazy and it starts working for him. It's the same thing, and you're just sitting there wondering, well, why isn't this working? The whole time then why does it look so now, i know we looked poor in the first half but that second half you're kind of looking at it and you're going why did we look so good that second half why don't you look like that all the time i think tonight he made some very good and he's been accused of this a lot about his substitutions being poor i think he made some very good substitutions tonight bringing on pogba and bringing on uh cavani taking off rashford and taking off fred like that that was the or taking off mctominay sorry it was a big call for him to take off one of his defensive midfielders to bring on pogba and uh, it worked out well for him because Pogba, as you said, changed the game when he did come on. Um, and then the second goal, which is, I, I don't think anybody had it in their mind that that was Harry Maguire going to be burying that one in. But um, then Ronaldo gets the third. And as you say, we switch up to being top of the group. Um, somewhere pre, pre any games being played, I think we sh- we kind of would have been expecting ourselves to be as top of this group. Um Maybe Villarreal giving us a bit of a, a hassle, but we we should have been comfortably in the top two. So going in a half time and being bottom of that group was kind of depressing. And you just wonder what was said in that dressing room. Like, you know, was was their boots sent kicking around? Did you know who stood up and said something? Like, was it Ronaldo? Was it 
to bloody ring Ferguson on the phone and have him give a team talk or something like, because I don't know what happened to the team that came out in that second half, but they came out like a fucking gunshot and there was three yellow cards within, what, two minutes for the all three of their defenders. Like, yeah. And you're just looking at it going, get that done in the first half and those three defenders are going to be shitting it because they've now got the whole rest of the game with a yellow card on them. And they've got Rashford, uh, Sancho, uh, Ronaldo, Cavani, Greenwood running at them. They'd be shitting themselves because they'd be like, if we give away one bad tackle, one of us is getting sent off and the same for the other. Mm. So I don't know what was said at halftime, but whatever was said seems to have sparked some life in them and they need to come out on Sunday playing like they did in that second half from the get-go. Yeah, I suppose... Uh, there, there shouldn't... There shouldn't be an issue with tempo on Sunday. No, you know what? What we're playing Liverpool, like it's 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 the biggest game in world football. Liverpool and Man United, you know, yeah. and, and and people will argue all day long, but it's the biggest game in world football. End of. And and if we have an issue coming out on Sunday with a lack of tempo and a lack of urgency against Liverpool, like that's that's just shocking. You know, it really, really is. Like I, I can see how it happens when you're in a group like we're in. Yeah. Where where you get a little bit complacent before a ball's kicked and the boys are looking at the table going, Yeah, so who'll we get in the fucking knockout stages, you know? Um, and I can see how that can happen. And all of a sudden they they, they start digging it themselves out of a hole, they do it with Villarreal, they do it there tonight, and all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're top of the group and you're thinking, Oh, we'll we beat young boys, we pick up a point in Atlanta. What what we're through, you know, and, and what was the hassle about? But like the points, t- the points tally in this group isn't going to tell the whole story. The group either, no, you know, because because we've had hairy moments in here to to get us to this. But like Sunday should be Sunday should be coming out of blocks. I just I would give one of my arms to just see someone come out on Sunday and in the first two or three minutes absolutely plant one of the Liverpool players just to set the tone. And that's not because it's Liverpool. That's because that's what teams should be doing, you know. That's what Noel wants Liverpool to do on Sunday, right? You know, and that's that's how fellas stamp their authority on a game. They go out and they they give someone a good knock in the first couple of minutes and they let them know, listen, pal, I'm fucking here now. And I'm here for the rest of the 90 minutes. So get bleeding used to it because I'm going to be in your face now. You know what I mean? Mm. And, and I want to see that on Sunday. I really, really do. I think looking at the group as well, the group is tightly poised still because now you're, now you're facing a tough away match to Atlanta and they want a bit of revenge on that because they mm-hmm. although they lost tonight and not feel hard done boy but they'll feel disappointed in themselves in the position that they were in to, to weaken off so much and give you guys the impetus to come back into it and I think you know if Atlanta were to do the business over there again just in Villarreal were to beat you boys again you boys will find yourselves in third place again in the group so it's yeah. very very tightly poised still you know I, I actually think the away game for us could be easier here, um, especially after tonight and how it unfolded on the basis that they're going to look at this and they're going to say, we had these fuckers dead and buried. We really let them off the hook there. The manager's going to send them out to do a job and to finish this, you know what I mean? And that's when we're going to get opportunities because we play our best football on the counter-attack. We don't play particularly good football when we have the ball too much. So I think there'll be enough space in, in Atalanta where we'll be really able to get the front foot and, and, and press very high up the pitch. And I, I'd imagine, I think we could be even more comfortable in Atalanta than we were at home tonight. Interesting call, because they only know one way to play. That's, that's play. it. and that's and that's variation, yeah. Yeah, no, 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 that's, and that's why, you know, I do, I, I believe the away leg will be, and I, plus, you've not got the fans on your back when you're 2-0 down either. You know? I think we needed them today, though. Them booing the boys off the pitch at that for, after that first half, I'd say that resonated with a few of those boys. Um, well, it, it should, but it just it shouldn't come to that stage. It, either. it shouldn't, you know it shouldn't what I mean? come to it's... that. But like sometimes that is 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 necessary. Like, and I think I do agree with you. Coming out Sunday, uh, somebody needs to like so, the likes of Scott McTominay needs to come out and fucking bury yeah. someone out. I'm not saying I want to see anyone get injured because you don't want to see no, anyone absolutely get injured. Not. No, absolutely not. I want to see that. him come out and get Salah and just bury him in that first two minutes of that game because you're unlikely to pick up a card that early. You know the ref will kind of. Give you their warning. Yeah, um, but listen, even if you, if you get the card, of... even if you get the card, it's still worth it to bury him out of it. Because you know Andy Robertson, that dirty little bastard is gonna bury someone out of it the second he gets the chance as well. Well, hopefully my family you're... does it in the box. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. but here, listen, if he gets the yellow early enough, 
he's not going to play the 90 anyway. He rarely plays the 90 anyway. Exactly. So it, Message would be coming on with 25, 30 minutes to go either way. Yeah. So let him go and rattle someone and take the yellow card and then just play, you know, be clever for the rest of the, for the, rest of the game, you know? Well, that's if Fred plays. Now, it looks like Fred pulled up on his hammy there when he was coming off on that. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see, does he start Matic and McTominay and then where do that's you go just, from there? That the, the lack of legs in there is absolutely scary. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know. think... It, I don't think he should do that, but no, you know that's no. the that's the likelihood of what's going to happen because he does like those two defensive midfielders. Yeah, and we'll need it. Or listen, you know, you never know. Does he go to five at the back? That's we've picked up a lot of our good results with five at the back. Yeah, um, or does he just plant Donny in there? I don't know. Like, I probably not. I think there's more chance. Of him, I think there's more chance of him planting me or Blade Noyle in there. Yeah, I absolutely. know. Yeah, even with the it's scary. Yeah. 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 yeah, Darren, I have to ask you. When Fred went yeah. across the front of the box there and he had that opportunity where you up off your couch. I know yeah, I was. I know you're kind of a Fred uh, fan. I am a Fred fan. I just think that like, he had a good game tonight. Mm. He really had a good game. He was everywhere. He put a, a serious shift in until he until he limped off, you know. Um, and I just think you need guys like that. I've said it before. We've too many players that, you know, that don't want to get down and dirty. Yeah, I, hundred, I absolutely understand he doesn't have the quality you know, going for him that, that maybe we want in that position. But there's nobody goes out and gives any more than that lad. There's really not like he's he's just everywhere. Every time you look at him, I would actually say at times it's to his detriment. You know, how someone hasn't said to him, listen, Fred, we don't want you near the opposition box. Sit in front of the two centre backs and scream. Don't go past the the semicircle on their side. After that, like someone shock him from the stands, just cattle prod him, you know, zzz, give him a little zap. And he goes, oh, shit, I'll go backwards. He doesn't need to be that high off the pitch. Not when you've got what we've got going on up there. Like you've got Pogba, you've got Greenwood, you've Fernandez, Ronaldo, Cavani, Sancho, Rashford. Fred doesn't need to be any near, anywhere near there. He needs to play defending midfielder and sit and cover Maguire and cover Lindelof and stop leaving them open like a bleeding 24-7 century. I, I, I suppose when you start like that the first 20 minutes, you probably feel there's an obligation on you to try and make it right. And you probably lose focus in terms of what your actual job and positioning is on the pitch because you're trying to correct a really bad situation. So everyone kind of loses their mind. It's like the next question I was going to ask you was, do you find with the amount of guys you have playing forward, and I don't mean in the full forward positions, but I mean in terms of forward thinking players, does it create a kind of a gap and an imbalance? Well, well, there's certainly there's certainly a disjointedness to the front for me, you mm. know. There, there doesn't seem to be any. Again, as you said, he looks like he's searching for what the formula is. And um, I think if 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 Rashford keeps playing the way he is in the last couple of games, Rashford's going to play on the left. You know, oh, yeah, you've, 100%. you're going you're going to have Greenwood play on the right because he's so dangerous and he's obviously coming inside and he's getting shots off like he did at Leicester. Bruno plays a 10 religiously, which leaves you with a striker. And, and are you going to bench Ronaldo and play Cavani? Probably not. So, I mean, what we started with tonight, for me, is more than likely going to be what we go with. But your issue is he needs to give Cavani game time. You know, he needs to give, uh, he needs to get Sancho involved because you've a 90 million pound sign in there sitting on the bench who, who's doing very, very little at the minute. He's got, his, his confidence is in his boots. He needs a couple of assists. He needs a couple of goals. He needs to get running at somebody, you know, where he can where he can build himself back up. I thought he had a really good game against Everton um, until he came off. And then again, you know, you don't see him for a little while and you're thinking, how's this going to work out for him, you know? But yeah. but he did, the, he did the exact same thing to Donny. The best player we had in the park the night West Ham beat us in the, uh, in the Carabao Cup was Donny. Kid hasn't played a minute since. You're like, yeah. Jesus Christ, is this, you know, has he done something that we don't know about? Is yeah. this Wilfred Zaha Mark II or what's the story like? I, I think for Sancho it's a little different though because Sancho kind of has something else to try to be competing with. Like Greenwood has been phenomenal. Like yeah, I know he's probably taken a few too many shots that he shouldn't be taking. You know, like there's there's a pass on and he probably should be given that. And then today when uh, Ronaldo took the shot and it kind of the keeper saved it, Greenwood should have been on that back post. But you know, it, this is a kid, a 19-year-old, or I think he's 20 now, kid, like 
that'll come to him and he just needs to you know develop that little bit but it's very hard to see him getting taken out of that team like Sancho to have to do something special to be taken out of that Rashford looks to be on cracking form whether he's missing those shots or not so Sancho's not going to be getting that left wing spot either so I think Sancho just needs to really you know when he does get that game I'm like I thought he was good when he came on tonight as well now thought he did well when he did come on um for Greenwood so he just needs to keep doing that and making sure that when he does get the game time that he's doing something with it Fred I know you're a big fan of him I think he does too much running around I think there's a lot of running around that the, the kid doesn't need to be doing and uh, I sent denial before uh, before you got on as well uh, I seen a quote and I don't know if it was from him or from someone else but he, they were saying that apparently out in the Brazil squad he was saying he feels he'd do better at United in a more forward role and I'm just looking at him going you might do better personally, but you're not better than Pogba. You're not better than Bruno. You're not better than Ronaldo. So forget about being a forward-thinking player. Get back there, sit in our hook and half, and just make sure that you do your defensive duties. Forget about being a forward player. I don't want to see your name in the headlights, mate. All yeah. I want to see you do is stop the ball getting to Maguire, stop the ball getting to Lindelof. You know, if, if Maguire and Lindelof never touch a ball for the entire game, you've done a fantastic job. Yeah. And and that's we've spoken about that before, and I feel like the issue is I checked there he played ten, yeah, and 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 now when he came into you know he, he still wants to play ten, but like you know there's so many footballers ahead of him. You have Bruno who plays there, you have Pogba who wants to play there, you have Rashford who could possibly play there, you have Lingard who wants a shot there. He's never getting. You have Donny who's on the bench, you know, with the with the reserves. Like he also wants to get involved. It, none of those he kind of get ahead of none of those in a ten. So if he's going to play and he's going to be in that engine room, somebody's just got to say, there's the line, don't cross it. Just don't cross it. You're yeah. a defensive midfielder. You don't need to. Like, if you look at any of the really, really good defensive midfielders in the league, or go, like, look at Claude McAlealy. He's probably the best defensive midfielder we ever have in that, ever had in that league. Right? He, it took him the penalty against Bolton to get on the score sheet. Because he never, ever got high enough up the pitch. Why did he not get high enough up the pitch? Because he's a defensive midfielder. He's there to sit. He's there to screen. He's there to play a role. He's not there. Like that, that's, that's an ego thing for me with Fred. And that's, it might be because he's a Brazilian and he thinks, you know, I'm a Brazilian. I'm a bit of a baller. Mm. You're not, kid. Just sit in front of the back for screen. As Ted said, if like the two boys like don't Fabinho. have a kick off, like, like Roy, like Fabinho. Now, listen, here's the thing. He's never going to be as good as Fabinho. Because, and I got to tell you, Massive fan of Fabinho. Um, there's good footballers and then there's clever footballers. Fabinho is a clever footballer. He's he steps ahead in his head, and that's why he looks so good. He never breaks stride. He, he everything is done at a at a real ease and a canter. He's a super super footballer. He barely breaks but, a sweat. Right, barely breaks a sweat. You put him in centre back, you think, oh, we can have a go with him. He's gone in centre back. No, you can't because he's just as good at centre back because he's clever. You know, he knows a what he's good at. The game. And he knows, A, what he's good at. But he's not going to get involved in stuff he's not good at. Mm. You know, he's like, I'm not really good at that. You know what? I won't do it. Whereas Fred's like, oh, you know, I'm not really good at that, but I'll fucking give it a bash anyway. Yeah, and as Fred, Fred tells... Fred wants a bit of everything. <laughs> as, as Ted says, he's like, he's running around like a headless chicken at times. And that's where United fans see him. They're like, why is he running? Why is he running? Now, it's great that he is running and he wants to run. But at the same time, sit and screen. Just sit and screen. Just cover a 20 yard or 20 yards wide area in the center of that pitch and just screen them two boys in front uh, behind you just screen just sit there you know but again for me Maguire's got a little bit to do there as well he does he's a Maguire, captain. Maguire's he's a, captain. a lot to be doing there now and he's sent he's playing center back so he knows Fred is ahead of him why isn't he on his te- Fred get back in Fred 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 you hassle the bloke enough he's gonna do what you want you know eventually he's gonna down tails and go do you know what it's easier to just do this and listen to this bloke Great. I've, I've made him tap out. That's all I want. Yeah. You know, I think Maguire's defensive um, awareness, though, is it, it's quite lacking. And it's it's kind of shown the last two games, like the game on the weekend, where for me, he was at fault for all four of those goals in some way, shape, or form. And then tonight, he wasn't across his man. For the first goal, he wasn't across the man. Um, and he kind of he, he played the man on side originally. And then tried to cut back to pull a, a, you know, an offside trap on it. I'm sure it was too late by then. And I'm just kind of looking at him going, do you really know what's going on around you, mate? I think, 
I think the thing with him at the minute is it's fairly, very obvious he's not fit. And and he's playing the captain's role and he's going, listen, I'm not going to leave you with fucking, with Boy and Lindelof. It's bad enough leaving me with Lindelof. I'm not yeah. going to leave you all with, with Boy and Lindelof. I'll get out there by hook or by crook. And do you want that from your captain? Absolutely. But at times it's probably to his detriment. Yeah, you know, where you know, he goes, I'm going to put myself before the team. Yeah, or I'm going to put the team before myself type thing, you know? But what you are saying about Fabinho, like the guy looks at it and he understands where he needs to be and where he should be. And I just don't get that from Maguire. Maguire seems to not understand what's behind him, where he should be standing. And it, it's not even just the last few games. It's for the last, like, since we've got him, like his defensive positioning and awareness seems to be quite poor at times. And I just wondered, you know, what what's wrong with this guy? Like, why doesn't he, why is he constantly being playing people on side because he hasn't stepped forward with the rest of them? If this guy's meant to be the captain, he should be the one making that call. Like, right, step forward now. And if, if somebody else messes it up, somebody else messes it up. But if it's you well, messing it up consistently, there's something I'd wrong say, there as the captain. I'd say, if, I'd say if you have a look at the amount of times that that happens, you'll find that Darren Wan-Masaka that's playing people on side. There, there is positionally, something. he's absolutely shocking. There, there is, you know? and I'm not, I'm not saying Wan-Masaka is clean from it either, but Maguire no. has been, there's been a lot of times, as, especially the last kind of like, the last few games, it's very obvious. And I know he's off the boil and stuff, but he should he's still not, he's mentally not be able. Yeah, but th- you don't need to be fit to be able to still read the game that's going on around you. You know, you should still be able to do that, and he is not doing it. Yeah, but, yeah, but think, he's, yeah, a, but he's a, not, a slow it, player anyway. Yeah, but it's not even that. I, I think he was exceptional the last six months of last season. I yeah, I think really he was really as well. I thought, I thought he was outstanding, to be honest with you. I thought he really stepped up as a leader for you as it pushes through some games yeah. at times. I think the problem is there is if you know in your own mind, these are professional players, if you know in your own mind that you're not fit, mentally it wears on you as well because the fear is that you're going to be the guy who's the leader who lets your team down and you're trying to compensate for that as well and you also know that what's around you I mean apart from the hair at the back who are you going to have a major amount of confidence in you know Shaw at times has looked a bit sketchy in the last few weeks Wan-Bissaka has looked sketchy in the last few weeks and obviously he's beside Lindelof as well who doesn't help things at all and I think his concern there is he feels like he has to take the mantle for a lot of that back line there at times that's been absolutely hammered over the last few weeks and being found wanting in games at times. You know, how many times have you seen balls played around? Just look at the Leicester game and stuff like that. Balls played around where there is where balls are played across the pitch and there's no defenders there. The whole pitch is empty, like, you know? And I, I think that's his concern. I think mentally it wears on him as well because I think with Maguire, he's a confidence player as well. And if his confidence isn't where it should be, and if you're not fit, you won't be confident. You're trying to get back to where you feel you need to be. It could be, yeah. But just for me, like, especially if you're, if you're going to be the captain and you're meant to be the one making these calls as the defence of, you know, his awareness about what's going on around him is quite poor. Like, that first goal, McTominay is behind that defence, like, behind the attacker that's on that. And you can say, you know, yeah, he needs to be in front of that man as well. But that ball gets played across three United defenders and all of them are out of position. And one of them's Maguire, one of them's Lindelof. The other one's Shaw, who, you know, was trying to track back because he'd let the player pass him in the first place. But you're talking two centre-backs and it's it's rolled past them because neither of them are aware of the man that's behind them. And you're just kind of thinking, lads, one of you needs to be catching that. But Ted, it was such a fast move. And if, you, if anyone knows anything about running in as a defender like that, it's such a difficult thing to do. Such a difficult... It's not easy to do that. On, on, on the screen, when you see it happening and the ball come across, you go, God, one of you has had to clear that and stuff like that. But the reality is it's not that easy. When you're running back towards your goal with a ball flying in like that and you know there's a guy over your shoulder coming in behind you, everything goes through your mind. You're nearly thinking you're going to put the ball in your own neck. But the, but the problem is that they weren't even in front of... Like, that's what I was saying. If you watch that goal back, Bef- just before the ball gets crossed, Maguire is blocking where the ball is going, like where it's about to go. Then he steps forward to try and play this offside trap, and then it just sails past him, and it gets tapped in, and you're just kind of looking at him going, what was that? Well, like you had the ball, you had it covered. You had where the ball, the only place that ball could go, you had covered. And then you stepped out of it, and then they scored. And I noticed that, and maybe it is just because he's, you know, he's unfit, but the last, the last two games, especially like that Leicester game, he was at fault for four of those goals. He's at fault for maybe not the first goal, but definitely that second goal tonight he's at fault for. And 
it's just, it's a bit questionable, you know, like I know what Darren's saying as a captain, he's trying to step in, but as a captain, you need to understand, like, if, if you're not, if you're not up to the challenge, you need to be brave enough to say, like, I can't do it. Well, I suppose, step away. I suppose sometimes as well you can look silly as well because you're trying to do the right thing and the people around you aren't on the same wavelength. Like how many times do you see players trying to play that offside? And yeah. The really, really good players play the offside and they're let down by the other players around them who didn't read the game the way they read the game. And then when it leads to a goal, everyone is saying, why the fuck did he step up? Why wasn't he in there blocking it and stuff like that? When in actual fact, when you go back and you look at how fast the play moves and stuff like that, he may have been doing the right thing and everyone else just didn't read the game the way he read it and now he yeah. looks stupid because he wasn't the one who went in and covered. But he might yeah. have made the right decision. It's very, very hard to call it. You know, yeah. it's, it's a very fine line there. You know what I mean? You could go back and look at that goal and each of the three of us here could go back and look at that goal and have five different opinions on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, but in the end, the guy who steps back to play the offside is the guy who looks like the idiot because he looks like he wasn't brave enough to go in and do the covering. Whereas in actual fact, if the three boys with him or four boys with him had a step back the way he did, it might have been an offside goal. Well, everyone had stepped forward. See, that was the problem. The, mm. It was the fact that the the the, uh, the Atalanta player was behind the ball that was played across. So mm. he was never going to be offside no matter how far ahead, like how far you stood off. That's what kind of, I was like... There's no way he's going to be offside. That ball's coming in from basically the the touchline. This guy can't be offside from here. Yeah. So you need it's to make sure you have back. that. You need to make sure that that's covered. Don't step out of the way of that. Make sure you have that covered. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm, I'm agreeing with you at some points. I think at times his awareness at times is lacking a little bit. There's no doubt about it. We've seen it against Leicester. There's yeah. no doubt about that. But as Darren said, that could be just a confidence thing in terms of his fitness at the moment. I mean, you think about it in that Leicester game, what had he got? He had 20 minutes under his belt before that game, jogging around on grass before they put him out there. And he's like, if you turn around, as Darren said in the game against Leicester, if, if you put him out there and say, listen, are you okay to go out there? He's the, he's the captain. He's the leader of the team. He's not going to turn around and say no. And then you end up being forced into a situation where Boyd goes out there and you get absolutely thumped. And he's sitting on the bench going, you know, I really feel responsible for this. Yeah, but at the half time, he should have been saying to, you know, the manager, like, Watching that at the halftime, the Leicester crowd had gotten to his head. He wasn't able to, it was like he'd put on Fred's boots or something. He wasn't able to pass the ball more than six yards in front of him without putting out a play. And you're looking at that and you're going, you need to go into a halftime talk and say, listen, I'm clearly not out of here today. Take me off. Because whether you're captain or not, like Gary Neville did that. That's how Gary Neville retired. He well, he went in and he said, I'm not out of Get well, me off this well, pitch. You see, I don't think that's the case. I think it's Solskjaer who should be doing that. Solskjaer should be able to, like, Solskjaer should make that call, but if you're the captain, you should be able to walk in there and say to the manager as well, like, I'm not at this, you should be taking me off. And then it's up to the manager to make that decision. But, like... But this but this is where we sometimes talk about Ollie's naivety and stuff like that. If Ollie sees that transpiring on the pitch, he knows Maguire has basically had no game time and barely any training time. He's been trusted into this position. First of all, like, we know he doesn't have confidence in Boye and... Boy, you spoke about wanting to leave the club and all this kind of thing, and blah, 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 blah. But if you're a really strong manager in that position, if that's a Jurgen Klopp or a Pep Guardiola or a Tuchel, he's turning around saying to McGuire, sit down there right now. We know you want to do this. We know you want to be a leader, but you're bloody well not ready. And that's it. And then they either change formation, they go to a back three or something different or whatever it is. He sits down. He doesn't have to carry the can for it. And everyone here is not standing around going, he was at fault for the four goals. Yeah, that's, that's where the management comes into it. Here's, Ole should be doing it as well, but like, if you're the captain, like, not even if you're the captain, if, if you're a player on a team and you know you're not up to the task that day, you should be able to say it to, you know, the manager as well. And it may, maybe he did, like, I don't know, we weren't in the dressing room, like, maybe he did and maybe Ole continued to play him, I don't know. But you definitely should be able to say that, like, get that. Gary Neville's come out and said that that's what he did on his last game. He said he went in a half time and he said, I'm getting roasted here, get me out of there. And he didn't play here's, again. Here's a here's a question I'd ask you. If he starts with Boy in the Leicester game and Boy is having the game that Maguire has, does he pull him? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. He does, right? Yeah. So 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 what Noel is saying there, and that, and that's what I'm agreeing with, is you know, there is a thing where he's looking at Maguire and he's going, you know, he's my captain, he's the best player I have. Does he I've I've got absolutely no faith in Eric Boy, right? Because I have a plan. 
Yeah. Because he's fit. He's 100% fit. He's raring to go. He trained mm. for, you know, he's training his boots off to get a game of ball. So, and regardless of whether Maguire turns around and says to him, listen, Gaffer, I don't feel like I'm ready. If Solskjaer says, I really need you on Saturday, kid, what do you do as captain of the club? You go, all right, Gaffer, I can do it. You know, the, that's what you do. You go, yeah, I can do it. Right? And you go out and you put it in. But then it's up to Solskjaer to say, I was wrong. I got it wrong. I, I shouldn't have played him. And he should have hooked him after, after Leicester got their first couple and maybe yeah. gone to a back three. But he didn't. He let it go further and further and further until it went so far, we'd now way back into it again. And at that stage, it's too late. It's like, so, it's like what, what, where I'm coming from at this when I talk about Solskjaer and like, you know, I often compliment him saying he comes back from the death all the time and this is how he does it at times, you know. But these are the decisions that have to be made. Is there a decision where you should drop Ronaldo and put Cavani in? Is there a decision where Bruno should be dropped and Pogba should be put in if you're not performing? We know that Bruno, since the start of the season, he hasn't been performing. And yet he's sticking with him, sticking with him, sticking with him. When you know that you have a ready-made replacement there in Pogba, whose creativity is unbelievable in that position. And we know it and we've seen it before. And yet that decision doesn't get made. You know, the Maguire decision versus the Boy decision or a back three or whatever it is doesn't get made. Is there a case where Ronaldo needs to be taken out of the team and Cavani be put in? And this is the issue that Man United fans are facing at the moment with Solskjaer. He has not got the CV or the balls to make those decisions. He won't do it. There's no way he's going to bench Ronaldo because the last time he benched Ronaldo, Ronaldo fucked off down the tunnel. He'd had enough and he was lucky that he stopped walking down the tunnel and not straight out of the ground. And this is what he's facing at the moment. He does not have the CV or the nous or the ability or the presence or whatever it is to face these guys down and say to Bruno, you're absolutely shocking for the last 12 weeks or whatever it is of the season or eight weeks of the season. You need to step out of the team for a while and put Pogba in there and make those decisions. And he isn't he's, going to make those decisions. He's not, for me, he's not backing himself. You know, he's not backing his instincts. He's not backing... You know, I'm doing the right thing. Everything is a second guess. And everything is, he does a fear of making bad decisions. But you can't live in fear. You've got to go and you've got to, you've got to give lads a chance. Ferguson did it for long enough. We looked at team sheets and we went, holy shit. Are we, ready? Are we playing that side? And then all of a sudden you thump someone and you go, Jesus, what did he know that we didn't? You know, we've seen it on, on, the, on, on social media. Some of the the elevens you know you went out with over the last over the last twenty years when Ferguson was in charge or whatever, and then it would say to you who which team did they play against and what was the score? You know we had some awful sides went out, but B teams because someone had the confidence to give them a game. Solskjaer doesn't have the confidence. Like I, I, certainly, I think Lingard should have played more minutes for us. You know he's looked very very good when he's come on when he's got involved. Give him more minutes. Why won't he give him minutes? Well, because then he's upsetting Sancho or then he's upset. You know. He gives Martial minutes. Martial's been absolutely dirty. He should be playing with the reserves. Off right. you go, kid. You're going in January. You know, you can toddle off up to Newcastle, get a few quid up there, because you're certainly not a Man United player. And you certainly won't be pulling on this jersey any longer. Um, again, have a set of bollocks and, and have the courage to go and make them decisions. You know, your fans won't hammer them for making them decisions, but they will hammer them for not making those decisions. And that's why you know your fans are getting on them. Well, that's why I think that the thing where I'm coming from is if you look at the things that tend to go wrong with United, he actually has a solution there for it. But he hasn't got the bravery, if you like, to make the decision, to put the solution in. And that's the problem. And even if he and even if he puts the solution in and it doesn't reap the reward that you want, at least he can leave there with a bit of bravery and his head held high and saying, well, listen, you know, when I had to fucking put the boot into Ronaldo or into Gavani or into Bruno, I fucking did it and I stood up and I said, uh, you know, I had respect for myself to turn around and go, I'm not just going to plumage these guys and, you know, just try and accommodate everyone and all that kind of thing. I'm going to put out my best 11. This is what I believe is my best 11. If you don't perform, perform for me, you're out of the team. Jurgen Klopp has no problem dropping Jordan Henderson. Yeah. You have to make those decisions if you're going to be strong. Or, if he's going to survive and he's going to move on the way Ferguson was at the edge and he survived, this is the way he's going to survive. If he steps up, makes those decisions, gives lads a kick in the arse, turns around to these guys and goes to Bruno or whoever it is, you're not performing. The fuck out of the team for a few weeks and put Pogba in there. Give Donny van de Beek the minutes he deserves. Give Jesse Lingard the minutes he deserves. He was outstanding for the last six months of last season. He basically got West Ham into Europe. 
nearly single-handedly, you know what I mean? Yeah. So he's good enough to do it. You've got to give him the opportunity, you know what I mean? You've got to be a manager. you got to manage these guys. And at the minute, and that's what I was going to, I was just going to say, you, you struck a chord there. He's, he all he's doing is accommodating players. That's all he's doing. And you can't accommodate 20 players into a team of fucking 11. Doesn't work. Yeah. The match doesn't work out, you know? So it, it's got to be, you've got to be a little bit harsher. You've got to be a little more cutthroat. You've got to say yay or you've got to say nay. Now, we know the guys in, in there that we can point at and we can say no. You know, if he doesn't trust Boy, don't have him on the bench. Don't let him have a spot. Give a spot to one of the young lads who maybe says, you know what, he's not ready yet, but if I can get him in a few minutes, I might be able to see something in him that, that maybe is going to step him ahead of the likes of Eric Boy. Give two and Zeebie those minutes when he was here rather than send them off to Villa. You know, don't give Anthony Martial a minute's football at Man United because yeah. the kid does not deserve it. If you buy Anthony Alanga on the bench there tonight, he looks like a real, real prospect. Get him fucking on. Get him minutes under his belt. Get him out there. Tell tell whoever it is. Tell Bruno. Bruno, you're on the bench tonight, pal. If it's Pogba, you're on the bench. We, we find it hard to accommodate the two boys in the team. But yeah. we keep trying to do it. You know what I mean? It doesn't necessarily work. Pogba goes to the left. Bruno goes in the centre, then Bruno goes out to the right, Pogba goes to the centre, you're like, listen, someone plays there, have, have two of them, tell him he's playing this game, he's playing the next game, and keep them on their toes where they know that fucking, there's a battle on for that spot. Bruno knows he can have an absolute stinker tonight, and guess what's happening on Sunday? He's fucking starting. So and when fuck- fellas get complacent like that about their f- spot, they don't give a fuck. Yeah, it, frust- it frustrates the hell out of me, and I'm not even a Manchester United fan. It's not either, like I don't have a card in this game, if you like. But it frustrates yeah. the hell out of me. A club the size of Man United that you have a manager there who has a player on the bench who he doesn't trust. I mean, that speaks volumes. And well. there's multiples, not you just have one. To trust your whole squad. You have to yeah. trust every one of them to turn around and say, you know, if, if you have to take Maguire out of there and you have to put Boy in. You have to trust the player that he wants the best for the club. You have to coach him. You can't find yourself in a position where you box yourself off from players, but yet you still put them on your bench. Donny van de Beek is the perfect example. What's Donny yeah. van de Beek and Eric Boye doing on the bench tonight? Why are they there? If he doesn't want them, just tell them you don't want them, as you said. Fuck them down into the reserves or let them go. Sell them. Why are you keeping them? Why are you telling Donny van de Beek when he wants to move in the summer? Why are you telling him that he has a future at United? And then you take the piss out of him. You know what I mean? This is what they happened. pulled it. They pulled the plug on his move to Everton. He was all sorted. He was on his way to Everton. Marcel Brown's got the whole thing boxed off. And at the last minute, there was a decision made to say, We're keeping him. He's going to play a part in our squad. Sitting on the bench, you know, as you said last night with the uh, Crown Jewel, getting a check for sitting, sitting and catering. What's the fucking point? Like, you know, get someone a spot. Well, you know, you know, it's going to be competitive in all these trophies. So they're going to have 60, 70 games a season. So you need your whole fucking bench. And, he, and he's taken up a spot that the likes of Hannibal could take. You know? Now, this kid looks an absolute fucking worldly for all the money in the world, but he won't get onto a bench when you've got fucking Nemanja Static in there who won't bleed and move, right? He's like the walking dead. He's fucking decrepit in there. And then you've got fucking Donny who Ollie clearly doesn't want to give a kick to. Get the two boys off the bench and say to, the, and say to Hannibal, there you go, kid. Get onto the bench there. Set him in field. Our ducks out. I might fucking need you. Get ready. And, and give then, the kid and, fucking game And time. this is at a time where the coaching at United is under scrutiny. The coaching yeah. at United is under scrutiny. The reason it's under scrutiny is because you look back behind at that bench there and when you need people to come off it, the same old people are coming off and that's fine. Tonight they did a job. I'm not saying you got out of jail tonight. You didn't because you fully deserved a victory with the 45 minutes you put in the second half. It was a game of two halves. They won the first half. You won the second half. But you ultimately ran out 3-2 winners. But I just think it, that it's symptomatic at United at the moment that there's so many players there at the moment that either don't fit into his thinking or he washes his hands of it and says, well, I'm not doing the coaching. I'm just the manager. But that's fine. If you're just the manager, manage the fucking people. Talk to your coaches and turn around and go, why are we putting him on the bench? Why are we putting him on the bench? when you don't have the confidence in him and I don't have the confidence in him that I don't want to give him a kick. So why is he there? What happens if Maguire gets a recurrence tonight of the injury and goes down, you lose him for another six weeks? You have to put Boye on. Who else have you got? We've we've said it for, I've said it for a long time. I cannot believe some of the stuff that seems to have gone 
on unnoticed that you know you some of the basic stuff. If you're Oli Gunnar Solskjaer, Kieran McKenna, your Michael Carrick, whoever you are, part, part of that coaching staff, if somebody sees Aaron Wambasaka day to day and doesn't say we need to fucking work on that lad's final delivery, like Stevie Wonder could tell you the kid couldn't cross a fucking road. Yeah, have they done a whole lot to improve him? Not by the fucking looks of it. Because if they have, it's certainly not shown. Is he an hour back after training with the boys whipping balls in? Obviously not. You know, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff like that. Obviously, Wamba Saka, that's, and on... that's the frustrating side. Yeah. You know, that that for me is massively frustrating. Yeah. That that we're still watching a guy who has plenty of ability, and don't forget, we pay big bucks for this kid. You know, he's a fifty million pound signing. He defensively, or sorry, positionally, so should say he's awful, right? And he, we, we, I heard one of the United fans recently tell me he was the best tackler in the league. I said he has to be the best tackler in the league. Positionally, he's one of the fucking worst. I said, which means he has to tackle like that to get himself back out of a hole every time. And then when he does get up the field where we actually want the kid, he couldn't cross a road. I feel like sticking a lollipop out in front of him and trying to help the fucker across. I, th- I think he has improved ever so slightly, which isn't saying a whole lot because that just tells you how bad he was prior to that. But there's a lot of other players similar to that, like Maguire as well. Like we, like I know we have Ronaldo now, and we kind of aim for him at corners. But for a year, for like the last kind of year or two, we've been aiming at Maguire for our corners, and the corn can't hit a barn door. We we employed a set piece coach in the summer. Every fucking game so far this year, we've either we've conceded from a fucking from a set piece, yeah. and some fellas getting a paycheck every week. Hold on a minute, yeah. lads. There's something fucking going wrong. We're actually going to take a bloke on who's going to suddenly make us worse at what we're doing. Like, yeah. Hold the fucking phone here. It's very simple. Like, you know, you, you need a leader. You need a talker. You need someone to tell lads, this is your spot. This is your spot. Get in the fucking thing and go and attack the fucking ball. Stop allowing the ball to come into the six-yard box because when it gets in there, we're at it's sixes danger. and sevens and it's fucking danger. But get lads to, to go and attack the fucking ball and get rid of it. But you also have to have a huge amount of confidence in the guy that's beside you. I mean, I think about when I think about that, I think about Ferdinand and Vidic. You know what I mean? Those guys would never question each other. They were always on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Always on it. There's a confidence there that one knew if one went wrong, the other guy was there to cover up and fix up and do all that kind of thing. You know what I mean? And I just don't think that confidence there. I think when McGuire is there, you can say what you want. He can turn around to Lindelof and say, you need to be there or you need to be there or Shaw or wan or whatever it is. But in reality, is the confidence there that they understand what he's talking about or what he wants to do or is he portraying himself the right way? You have to have confidence in yourself. Or if you look at Virgil van Dijk, Virgil van Dijk has the ultimate amount of confidence in himself. So he knows that he's confident in his ability. And that confidence spreads throughout the players that are around him. You see, oh, he's, yeah. at, he's at an advantage straight away, though, isn't he? Because he's Dutch and they all just think their shit smells like roses. But I like that about them. Do you know what I mean? They've all got that little bit of a chip on their shoulder where they think, I'm a little bit fucking better than you, Pan. You're thinking, what? You know, what the fuck did I... But he's right. He's right. The, the thing I'd like to see with, with McGraw, Maguire and Varane or Maguire and Lindelof, whoever it's going to be, right? Maguire has strengths. Let's start playing to them. When the ball is lumped up field, I don't want to see Victor Lindelof go with a fucking header because he's not going to win it. And I don't want to see fucking Harry Maguire dropping off behind him because he hasn't got the legs to fucking tidy up. Whereas if Maguire goes to win the headers, Lindelof might be able to tidy up behind him or Varane. So, but don't let me see fucking Lindelof go to try and win headers against fucking Duvan Zapata. You see Zapata roll him earlier on when he got in on that. Oh, the God. Fuck me, lads. I'll, it was like what. he was ragdolled. It I'll really tell you was. what, the De- Gea saved their asses there because if that goes in, that was still 2 1 at that stage. If that goes, or was it, had it gone to 2 all at that stage? I think it was 2 all. Was it two all percent? Yeah. 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 If that, goes, if that goes, if that goes, three two to them, you would have had a problem. Yeah, it would have been a yeah. big, big problem. And I'm telling you, two massive saves from De Gea. Like, and I know, I know we've been conceding a lot recently, but I don't know if I can put any of those goals, any of the goals we've conceded down recently down to De Gea at all. Like, I think he's, he's been, been phenomenal he's been probably, recently. He's probably been our best player this season. I would have thought. Uh, he's back to he's back to the old David De Gea. He is phenomenal at the moment and. You know, you're looking at this and you're like, yeah, but that guy conceded four goals, you know, on the weekend. And you're just kind of thinking... I'm as mad at the match for United. Yeah, and you're just thinking, <laughs> could he have stopped any of those four? Like, those Nobody four goals, could he, could he stop any <laughs> of them? Not like, argue. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you're looking at a keeper who's lot, who's conceded four goals going, yeah, he conceded four, but, like, 
there's nothing he could have done about any of them. And then again today, concedes two goals. So we've we've been leaking goals, but I don't I can't put the hay at fault for any of them. And that just that says everything about what's in front of them. I'm just I'm just thinking here while you were talking there, and we were talking about Harry Maguire. Do you know how you turn Harry Maguire into a real world class central defender? If a new manager goes in there, do you know what he'll probably do? Take the fucking captaincy and the weight yeah. of it off him. Take it off him, yeah. Put it to someone else. And take that off him and let him focus on his job and what his job is to do, as opposed to the weight of the team. And I think you'll see a very different Harry Maguire. There's no doubt. I don't know. I, I don't know. I think he'd I think he'd get the best. No, 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 no not no, even no, I mean, I, no, I mean, if the right manager comes in. I'm not talking about... Like I don't think if Ollie did it, I don't think he would say it the right way. I think he'd say it as a slur on him. But I think yep. if you bring a Conte in there or a Zidane or whoever it is, a top level manager in there, and he goes around him and goes, I want to take that captaincy off you. I want you to focus on being the best defender in the world and give that captaincy to someone else who has that kind of, I don't know what it is, a little bit of a swagger, but a little bit of nous and a little bit of something else. You know what I mean? But I, I just think with him, I think he's trying to carry the weight of the team through the captaincy. And I think it's weighing on him in terms of his own performances and stuff like that as well. And I think there's a call there. I think if a new coach comes in, I think they might take the captaincy off. I think if a new coach came in, that captaincy band would be going to Cristiano Ronaldo and that would be the end of it. And I don't know whether that's the right decision. Either. I'm not saying that's the right decision, but I think that's where they'd be going. They'd be taking it off because there's no, I don't, other than maybe the hey, I don't know if there's any other player you can say they should be taking that captaincy. You can say Bruno, but he hasn't been at it recently. So I, I think the only player that would be getting handed that is Cristiano Ronaldo. There you go. There's the captaincy. No one's going to question if Ronaldo's your captain. There you go. And that would be the end of it. I don't, I don't think he lives it no matter who comes in. I think I think I think it does something for him. I know we're talking about, you know, he's maybe he's lacked a little bit in the last couple of games and stuff, but he's not fit. He's he's try, out there to try and do a job. And I think that's the sign of a captain and the sign of a leader, if I'm honest, where he's got a set of balls and he said, You know what? I'm not right, but I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna do me fucking damn this for these boys. And he did enough tonight to help us get over the line, don't forget. He got a goal and he and he kept he a little bit out at that end. So we can't pour petrol over him either. But he you know, I think that Captain Airman, Captain's Ironman does make him a little bit taller. It does make him a little bit stronger. You know, he gets a little bit of a power from that. And I don't think necessarily it weighs on him. For me, I don't think it does. Um, I've seen Ironman's weigh on, fellas. I don't think it weighs on him, if I'm honest. Um, I think I'd absolutely hate to see it on Ronaldo. Um, I think it'd be, yeah, it'd be a horrible decision to make. Um, and I think, you know, Maguire is our natural leader. He is the guy who does a lot of the talking. He is the guy that when we're in games, you see him trying to step forward with the ball and he's telling lads, come on, move into space, move into areas. That is a leader. So why wouldn't he have the armband, you know? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I just think if a manager did, if someone like Zidane comes in, I see that captaincy going to Ronaldo one way or the other. Like, I'm not saying it's the right decision, but I think yeah. that that's where it'd go. If Zidane comes in, it's going on Pogba. <laughs> Make well, no possibly, yeah. <laughs> Make no mistake about that. Um, well, listen, lads, it's been a pleasure having you on, even if I have to spend nearly an hour talking about Man United, which is why not. We like you loved it. Listen, it's fun, you know what I mean? And it's good to get an outside opinion as well. Like, I won't say a neutral opinion. I was going to say an unbiased opinion. opinion. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to tell you how you fix your problems, and I'm a Liverpool fan, you know what I mean? Ollie at the wheel all day long, lads. Um, but listen, a pleasure I think, as always. I think well, we got that, the we got the predictions right, didn't we? Me and Darren both had three two on the the last show, didn't we? For United, yeah, tonight. we so, thought we thought there might be goals, and we thought we might just nick it. Yeah, right? we yeah. we had it spot on there. Just uh, I would have hoped it was a little bit cleaner than it was, and not just all in one half. But sure, Darren, we'll Darren, take it. You, Darren, you have been on your rolls with predictions, boys. Now I'm not going to get you to predict Sunday yet because we are going to be doing a preview, so you can hold your predictions till then. Let's say. Uh, how many players came out of tonight on Skyf and last night before we make mm. any predictions. Lads, as always, a pleasure. Dynamo Podcast Network on YouTube for the videos. If you want to contact the show at the underscore over underscore tier. Um, and if you want to listen to audio versions show, you'll find us on Spotify, Podbean, iTunes, wherever you find your audio versions of the shows. You'll find us on Facebook and on Instagram, the upper tier. And we will talk to you again real soon. Cheers, boys. Okay. Thanks, lads.